So we're going to check this out. I'm going to show you. See, it's a yellow flower. We're going to squeeze this and see. Yep. See the red? So there's actually like a red liquid in St. John's wort flowers. So when you infuse this in oil, your oil actually turns red. It is super cool. These are beautiful. Hey there, welcome to Savory and Sage. I'm Jen. I am out in the garden today, this evening. Um, it is evening time. It's been a scorcher of a day here today, mid thirties uh, with Celsius with, and humid, humid, humid. So it's overcast there now. I'm hoping it's not gonna rain. Um, it's kind of half tolerable to be outside. So we're gonna take a little walk around the garden and check out the medicinal herbs that I have growing. Uh, see where things are at so I can make a plan as to what I'm going to be harvesting next and that'll give you some indication as to what could be coming up on the channel because I'm kind of making videos as I harvest things and as I utilize herbs from the garden. So yeah, we'll have some fun with this today and I'll also probably point out some of the herbs that I feel are really good for beginners who are uh, looking at adding medicinal herbs to their gardens. So I've got several here that would be perfect for a beginner to start. So let's get started. We're gonna start behind me in the marshmallow garden. Oh yeah, I need a fan here tonight. It's really warm, Whew. but not as bad as today. So let's get started. So this is my little marshmallow garden. I'm looking at expanding it a little, but marshmallow tends to spread over time. So I'm okay with this. So see these tall plants right here? There's all kinds back here. This is all marshmallow flower. I don't think any of it is flowering quite yet. It's getting real close, but I don't see any flowers on it yet. But this, I'll go over to this one. This is what we call marshmallow. And this one grows really well in wet areas or moister areas, like kind of marshy areas. So if you have a naturally wet area on your property, marshmallow would be a wonderful, wonderful medicinal herb to grow. It's super easy to grow. Like I've done nothing here, really. Uh, very little maintenance, you know, and it's got lots of competition from weeds and stuff and I don't really worry about it too much. It's just, it's a nice hearty flower. I am down on marsh level here. This is all marsh over here. So that's why I chose this spot in the garden for my marshmallow flowers. So marshmallow root, we harvest the roots of the marshmallow. They're very mucilaginous. So they're almost, um, they don't seem like it when you first harvest them unless you go to break it. If you crack it, they have almost like a, I don't want to say slimy because that sounds kind of gross. Sorry, there's like, black flies out tonight like crazy. I think we are gonna get a little bit of rain actually. Um, but yeah, so marshmallow root is very mucilaginous, kind of um, almost like slimy. Yeah, like it's not a good description, but just very soothing for um, skin irritations, for sore throats, um, tummy aches, digestive issues, all that kind of stuff. So it's a great, great herb to grow. I add marshmallow root to my winter um, elderberry syrup and it just makes a wonderful addition to that. It's also great for making your own homemade lozenges or homemade uh, cough syrup, that kind of thing for using in teas. So just a wonderful, wonderful herb. So you just harvest the roots in the fall and you dry them, chop them up and dry them, and then you can utilize them throughout the winter. I do have a video on drying marshmallow root and using marshmallow root, so if you haven't checked that out, I will put that in the description. I'll put the link in the description, or you can find it on my channel. Um, I don't have, you know, oodles and oodles of videos on my channel yet, so it shouldn't be too hard to find. Fairly new to YouTube, but uh, if you wish to know more about marshmallow plant and marshmallow root, be sure to check out that video. So we're gonna head up to the potager garden, I think. Actually, we may stop one spot before we hit the potager. So let's head up there now and see what else we have growing. 
So we're going to stop right here. These are very small. But I gave them a little TLC this year, so I'm hoping that they're actually going to start growing. This is one of my elderberries. So I planted five elderberry trees. There's another one. There's another one. This is a different one. This is a black lace elderberry. I bought this one at a nursery actually, and the other ones were started from cuttings. But this one's actually got a couple of bunches of flowers on it. So I'm pretty excited. This is only year two for this one. Elderberries, to my understanding, sort of prefer a damper area as well. So the area I have it is not the most ideal. There's another one there. So I tried to mulch it up just to kind of keep the soil damper. So I'm hoping that my elderberries will grow. For now, I'm sort of stuck buying elderberries. So I buy organic uh, dehydrated elderberries. And um, I make elderberry syrup on a regular basis. Anyone that knows me knows that I'm a big um, lover of elderberry syrup. I really believe in its benefits and I always make sure I have some on hand, especially during the winter months with cold and flu season and that kind of thing. I think it's a great booster for your immune system. Um, you know, I'm not saying you should go out and do that. Obviously, anything that uh, any kind of herbal medicine that you are looking at taking, make sure to do your own research. But I personally think it's great for myself. Um, so I'm trying to get those elderberries to grow. They're supposed to be pretty easy to grow, but uh, like I said, I think they prefer a damper area and I just don't have that set up there for them. So I may relocate them down the road, but for now, I'm just building up the mulch and the soil around it to try to encourage it to grow faster. So I hope by the end of the season, we'll see a big improvement. All right, off to the potager garden. All right, this is my little potager garden. My work in progress. Things that have to be planted or composted at this point. As you can see, it's coming along. I left my fertilizer buckets out in the rain. I'm hoping those caps are actually waterproof. I haven't looked inside yet because I don't want to cry. All right, we're gonna go right over to this one. So this lovely back here, well, minus the um, nitrogen fixers there, the weeds, this, is St. John's wort. So I only planted this St. John's wort last year, but it's doing marvelous and I am super excited about this one. So we're gonna check this out. I'm gonna show you. See, it's a yellow flower. We're gonna squeeze this and see. Yep. See the red? So there's actually like a red liquid in St. John's wort flowers. So when you infuse this in oil, your oil actually turns red. It is super cool. These are beautiful. So I'm hoping to do a wonderful oil infusion with this and I'm actually gonna make a nice uh, salve with this. Hopefully it's gonna be a nice color of red. I do have to come in and weed this garden, big time. So St. John's wort, most people know St. John's wort for um, its um, uses with depression, anxiety, ADHD, OCD, like those types of things. Um, it's very well known, I think, through the population, especially people who are interested in herbal medicine and that kind of thing. Um, for me, so you could certainly use that like as a tincture or, you know, whatever the case might be. But for me, I mainly use St. John's wort in oils, um, 
to use in like an oil or a salve or that kind of thing. It's very good for muscle and joint aches and, and uh, those types of things. So that's what I'm after. Um, so yeah, I'm going to use that for an oil infusion. We do have St. John's wort growing wild around here, but I haven't found a lot that aren't right at... <laughs> flies the flies that aren't right like on the roadside and I don't like harvesting things that are right on the roadside one because it gets dusty especially if it's a dirt road and two because the roadsides tend to be sprayed often um, by you know the powers that be to try and keep weeds and trees down and that kind of thing so I try to stick away stay away from harvesting anything that's um, that's growing on the roadside so I decided to try growing St. John's wort in my garden. Like I said, this is year two, so I am planning on spreading this quite a bit because it seems to grow really well. So I would say that this is also a good herb for a beginner because it seems to be growing so, so well. Um, and it's just really pretty in the garden. So let's see what else we got. I see something else that's blooming. We're gonna look at our chamomile there now. So here's my chamomile bed. Well, I have other things in it. I have some poppies over here, and I have calendula over there, which we'll get to. But first, we'll talk about chamomile. Chamomile is a wonderful, wonderful starter herb to grow. Look at the bugs in that, though. <laughs> I'll probably have to rinse these flowers before I dry them for tea. We'll see. I don't usually get a lot of bugs in my chamomile, to be honest. This is the first year. So, these little flowers uh, make a wonderful, wonderful tea. So this, we just pluck these off, and we dry them, and I store them, and just make a tea with them throughout the winter months. Chamomile is a great bedtime tea, a good sleepy tea. It's very relaxing and soothing. Um, it's great with maybe some lemon balm for a nighttime uh, sleepy tea. Uh, I like it with just, just chamomile. My husband loves it. Um, he couldn't wait for my chamomile to grow again because I ran out of my dried chamomile from last, last season. So I'm going to start harvesting this this week for sure and dehydrating it and saving it for tea. So when I go to make a tea, I just throw, you know, a tablespoon or two, like what, I fill a, a tea ball, like a tea infuser, and uh, just put it in a mug of hot water, and it's great. It's definitely something that'll help sort of chill you out before you go to bed and calm you. It's good for like anxiety, that kind of thing. Um, I think chamomile's pretty well known for that. Chamomile is also really good though for skin issues and that kind of thing. So it's it's good to add to uh, infused oils and salves and creams and that kind of thing to um, to help soothe skin issues. So I may try it try it out like that too. But for the most part, our chamomile is usually uh, saved for tea. So that's a wonderful one to grow. This is just started from seed. Just toss the seeds over the soil and. It, it grows in no time, so it's super, super easy to uh, to grow. And it self-seeds. If you leave enough uh, seed heads here, it will self-seed the following year. But I always start new just to make sure I got lots of chamomile for the year. All right, we're going to go over to the calendula garden now, or calendula patch, I'll call it. So here are some of my calendula flowers with weeds. And I am just noticing that there are buds. I did not know that. I didn't notice that until right now. So that's pretty exciting. All kinds of buds. Calendula is super easy to grow. Uh, another great, great starter herb for your garden. Uh, beautiful flower. Can't really say enough about calendula, really. It's one of my all-time favorites. I have calendula kind of popping up all over the place. That's another one that'll self-seed. Um, really easy to save seeds from. The seeds are pretty unique looking and uh, just an easy, easy flower to save your seeds for the following year. Um, it is an annual. I think it, 
yeah, I'm going to say it's totally an annual. It may, so people may sort of call it like perennializing in certain climates. I don't know if that's just because it self-seeds. Um, I mean, to me, it's an annual. So I do plant seed every year, calendula seed. It's really best direct sown. You can start it in the house. Um, I have, and I've had lots of, lots of success with it, but I have such limited space with seed starting in the house because most of my in-house seed starting is for food production. Um, that I find flowers I just direct sow if I can and calendula is great for that. So it's a beautiful little flower. It's uh, easy to dry and easy to infuse in oils. Great for all kinds of skin irritations. Great to make in a like a salve with beeswax that kind of thing. Um, really well known for using on diaper rashes and irritations like that with babies. Just very gentle and calming and soothing. So definitely a great starter herb for your medicinal herb garden. I highly recommend it. <laughs> dragonfly just flew right in my face. Oh well. There's lots of dragonflies out. Lots and lots the last few days. All right, so let's see what's next. We talked about calendula. I have some purple cone flower behind me. It's kind of not much to look at because I just started it this year, but I'm going to show you anyway. But down here, like I said, it's not much to look at. I'm going to take some of these little weeds out. This is echinacea or purple cone flower. Now, these are only starts that I did from seed this year, so there's really not much to look at but I'll put a picture up of purple coneflower. So purple coneflower is also known as echinacea. I think most people have heard of echinacea. I think it's very well known for its, uh, in the herbal world, for, my hair keeps going in my face. It's very well known in the herbal world for its, you know, immune boosting and ability to help fight colds and flus and that kind of thing. So uh, definitely a great herb to grow in your gardens. Um, I planted those from seed. They were, I mean, they did grow pretty good. They're, they're growing. I think it just takes a lot longer from seed. So you can buy purple cone flower at garden centers and that kind of thing. Uh, might be a little bit easier if you want to establish your garden a lot quicker. But uh, for me, I had the seeds, so I decided to really try and grow a lot of them. So I have probably 10 or 15 plants throughout my garden. So I'm hoping by next year I'll be able to start harvesting roots. You can use um, the roots or the flower from the echinacea and you can do all sorts of things with it. Teas, you can put it in oils, you can add it to um, you know cough medicines or immune boosting medicines with elderberry, that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, so echinacea would be great as well. I don't know if it's right there at the top, like the easiest ones to grow, but it's definitely one to add to your gardens if you really want those, you know, immune boosting and cold and flu type herbs. So that being said, we may be to the end of this one. I think we're going to walk over yonder. I have a few more things to show you. Actually, before I forget, I'll show you my lemon balm plant. Now I had this in another video. I did do a video on lemon balm. I actually tested out, I didn't do a lot on the benefits, but I just tested out a few recipes. So if you're interested in that, I'll link that in the description as well. But lemon balm is very lemon scented. It's from the mint family. Lemon balm makes a wonderful tea. Um, that was the main way I used it. Um, up until a couple of weeks ago when I tried out some recipes. So yeah, if you're interested in that video, I'll link it down below. But otherwise, you can harvest lemon balm for tea. You can use the fresh leaves. That's going to give you the best tea. Um, but you can also dry it. It's just going to be a really mild lemon flavor. Really not much uh, lemonness, lemoniness to it. <laughs> Is that how you say it? I don't know. But it's a very good one to add with chamomile for tea. 
um, because it is so soothing and relaxing and sort of helps with like anxiety and just kind of calm you down before bed that kind of thing so that's and it's pretty easy to grow I gotta say that lemon balm plant has just taken off it doesn't spread the same way mint does either even though it's in the mint family mint will take over your your garden lemon balm spreads but just very gently and like it kind of mounds and just sort of gradually spreads out so not one that's going to be really invasive the way mint is just in case you're wondering um so yeah we're going to take a walk over yonder i have two more things to show you guys i just noticed that some of my hascaps are ripe or starting to be ripe this is just a fairly new tree but i just picked this one i'm gonna taste it Hascaps are relatively, they were relatively unknown to me up until a couple of years ago and I read about them because I really didn't, I hadn't heard of hascap berries. They're not common around here. So I ordered some trees and planted them and they're just starting to produce a little bit. So I'm going to try that. Mmm. It's like a very tart, whew, like a very tart blueberry. Mmm. I don't know if it gets sweeter than that. It's probably not 100% ripe, but I'll wait for the other ones to get a little more ripe. And maybe that's the way they are. They're still good, tart or not. All right, we're gonna go yonder. All right, over here. It's gonna be hard to kind of see, but we'll get there. Right here, this is a mullen plant, even though there are things eating my mullen plant slugs I guess by the looks of that damage. So I have several mullen plants. They do grow wild here but not um, they're not that common to find. So if you haven't heard of mullen, mullen is well known in history as a plant that um, can help soothe the respiratory system um, helps with coughs and bronchial issues and that kind of thing. My favorite way to use mullen is in like an inhalation. So last winter um, we tried it out a few times and it did help. It helps with the airway um, just to soothe the airway and help open it up and that kind of thing. Um, helps break up, you know, respiratory phlegm, that kind of thing. Um, but to do an inhalation with it, you're just, we dry our mullen and you're just going to make it like a tea into a bowl with hot, hot water and just do it like a steam. So then you put the towel over your head and kind of go down into the bowl and just inhale, naturally inhale the steam. And it's very helpful. Um, indigenous people actually smoked it, ironically, for lung issues. So it's kind of ironic because you wouldn't think smoking something would help, but apparently it helped tremendously. So I don't think I'm gonna try it that way though. Um, it, it is used in teas as well, but with teas, the leaves of mullen are really kind of hairy. They have fine hairs, so that can irritate your throat. So most people recommend, if you're going to use it for tea, to strain it really well to get those um, fine hairs out because it can cause irritation. Um, so just to note that for sure. But mullen, it's growing really well, so it's very easy to grow. It is a little bit invasive, so if you're going to grow mullen, you probably should do it um, if you have a large property. Like we have a large property to fill and I had no problems planting mullen here on my property. But um, if you've got a really small property, it's probably not your best choice. If you can wild forage it in your area, that's the best way to get mullen. And, uh, and like I said, we do have it around here, but it's not plentiful. Uh, but you don't need a lot anyway. You only need a handful of leaves to do you for the year. But that's mullen. So otherwise, I am right now in our little fruit orchard. Um, we planted some fruit trees here several years ago. They're starting, just starting to put on some growth and start producing now. We bought them at the end of the year um, sale kind of thing. They were really in hard shape, but we got them dirt cheap. So... 
we're glad to see most of them doing really well. So this area I planted mint. Um, just transplanted mint from our other garden because it did, um, it, you know, it is so invasive. But I love mint, so I wanted mint around. So I planted it here kind of as a ground cover. I also have comfrey planted here. So we're gonna talk about those a little bit. I'm gonna turn the camera around and show you that stuff. So here's one comfrey plant. Now my comfrey is not super big. I have a couple more plants that have gone to seed. But this is comfrey. I planted like 50 roots, oh, last year. <laughs> all over the place. Comfrey is really good in permaculture. This stuff is super for fertilizing. The root systems help break up soil. Uh, there's so much good stuff to know about comfrey. I can't get into it all on this video. But for our purposes, we are going to be using the comfrey leaves and the comfrey root in some oil infusions, again for salves. If you haven't noticed, that's my favorite way to use things. Not really, one of my favorite ways. So this is comfrey gone to flower. So comfrey is a little bit of a controversial plant. Um, there's a lot of controversy over taking comfrey internally, but there's still a lot of herbalists that will utilize it in certain cases. But if you're gonna take comfrey internally, you're gonna look into that. Um, please be really diligent in doing your research on it. For us, I'm just gonna stick to using it for topical applications. Comfrey is really good for wound healing. Um, it's well known for its ability to help heal sprains and breaks, like fractures of the bone, that kind of thing. So it's a great thing to have in your medicinal cabinet. Again, I don't know if it's the one for beginners. I really don't think it is. But um, definitely one to keep in mind, especially like we planted a lot for the permaculture uses of it. We need, we don't have a lot of fertility on this property, so we're really trying to build up the property. And it's take, it takes years and years and years. So comfrey is one of those things that we add it to the garden, probably more for the permaculture uses than for the medicinal uses. But I thought it, you know, it was definitely worthy of a mention in this video. So the last thing I'm gonna mention is mint. And I'm just looking for a patch of mint. I can smell it, but I gotta find some patches. All right, here's a little bit of mint. So I transplanted a lot last year. So this is just starting to grow now. But you can see it looks pretty similar to the lemon balm leaves. So you can see that they're in the same family, right? So mint is definitely a good plant to grow, but if you don't have a place like I do to let it sort of grow wild, like we're sort of, we got mint planted all throughout here. Um, if you don't have that kind of place, then you're better off growing mint in a container. So because mint can be so invasive, yeah, you're better off growing it in a pot or a container if you don't want it to spread throughout your garden. Um, I don't mind because of the area that we have, but if you're on a small property and you want to grow mint, keep it to a pot. Um, and you really don't need a lot of mint anyway, depending on what your, what your needs are for it. But mint is a great addition to a tea as well. It's great for soothing the uh, tummy, digestive system if you have a tummy ache, that kind of thing. So it's definitely a great herbal uh, plant to have on your homestead. Um, so yeah, I would, I would recommend mint for sure. You can also do your own mint extracts, um, that kind of thing for use in baking throughout the season. Great for Christmas baking, you know, that kind of thing. I'll probably do a video on that. That'd be great. Yeah. All right, on that note, I'm going to call it a night. It is uh, getting pretty swarmy with flies here. I'm getting eaten alive, um, prior for the course here lately. So thank you so much for watching the video. I sure hope you enjoyed our little walk around the property at the medicine that we are growing. I didn't cover everything that we're growing, or nor did I cover everything that we can wild forage on our property. You know, we have yarrow growing wild, we have fireweed growing wild, but I'll talk about all that as the season goes on and as I harvest that kind of stuff. 
So keep watching. Make sure to subscribe if you're interested in seeing my future videos and feel free to share on social media um, for others to be able to check out my channel as well. Take care and have a wonderful day.